Okay, we're going to get started with the second presentation here shortly. Just as a reminder, this next presentation will award one CEU credit hour. That CEU will be sent to you electronically uh, via email. Remember to recall those code words and I've gotten um, a couple of questions about the code words. What are we doing with the code words? What are the code words? And just wanted to address those um, real quick. So the code words will be, um, you'll ask to be to recall the code words in the CEU questionnaire, which you'll fill out after this and before the end of the day on November 5th to receive the CEU credit. I hope that answers your question. Feel free to email us if you have any additional questions. Um, remember to, to list any questions that you have in the chat box. Um, so our next presenter can utilize that. And without further ado, I will move forward with introducing her. So Elizabeth Blanchard Hill brings a broad range of experience and maturity to her role as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. After earning a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University in 1988, she was award-winning television medical reporter for 10 years. This was followed by five years as a corporate trainer and several entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial <laughs> pursuits related to healthcare. In 2008, she returned to college to become a registered nurse and worked at the bedside on a variety of units, the ICU, the PCU, ortho, neuro, psych for about seven years. In 2018, she completed the PMHNP program with honors at Vanderbilt University. Ms. Blanchard Hills is on the legislative committee of the state of the Kansas State Nurses Association and serves as a member at large for the Kansas chapter of American Psychiatric Nurse Association. She devotes her free time to public speaking, writing guest editorials, and being a media source for mental health issues. Ms. Blanchard Hills, Hills specializes in holistic psychiatry and EMDR for trauma work. Her private practice, Inspired Psychiatric Care, is in Oberlin Park, Kansas. Please give a warm welcome to Elizabeth. Well, thank you so much, Kay, for that very warm uh, introduction. And I will say that the applause was absolutely deafening. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I'm very, very excited to be here. Thank you to, to Resolve for putting on uh, this awesome event. And uh, we're having some te technical difficulties on the PowerPoint. We're on the same PowerPoint. I know we're not seeing PowerPoint. Go ahead. And um, I'm just going to kind of continue talking. Apparently we're having some, um, some technical challenges. So please just bear with us. Um, I was remembering my former days as a television producer and reporter and thinking, you know, it's just incredible to me that we've been able to go <clears throat> from hosting conferences in large, large rooms to um, essentially holding a conference for folks across the Kansas City area here in a tiny office. And if all else fails and we can't get the PowerPoint up, oh, it looks like it's coming up now. Um, I have it downloaded on my phone. Is that not amazing? And I can speak to it from my phone. What? I don't know. So we're just holding here, just kind of waiting for the PowerPoint slides to come up. We're just leaving. We're just getting them all set up and ready to go. Okay. 
And what I'm going to do, even though you guys can't see me, is I'm going to go grab my phone as we continue to work through our technical difficulties. We are ready. Okay, guys. sorry about that. Just it just keeps things interesting, right? <laughs> keeps us all on our toes. All right. So I'm live, and are we seeing this slide or? Okay. All right. Thanks. If we could in, uh, go ahead and advance. Oh, here I can. I can do it as well. There we go. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so as you heard earlier, um, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner at Inspired Psychiatric Care in Overland Park, Kansas, um, and looking forward to, uh, to seeing you all, well, working with you all today. And Katie, were you going to sit beside me and just kind of help me with um, chat questions and teleprompter stuff? All right, so again, um, I think I may have mentioned that I'm a former journalist and I enjoy keeping up with the news. Uh, those of us on the front lines of providing healthcare during COVID have been stressed, right? Very, very stressed. And just real quickly, um, Katie, maybe you can help me with this. Out of curiosity, how many nurses do we have in the audience today? If you're a nurse, can you let us know through the chat feature? I would just love to be able to see that, if possible. And while we're waiting for those answers to come in, um, I will say <laughs> it's okay. It's all okay. You know, I, I jokingly say, and I say this often to my patients, if you have a pulse and an airway, no matter what, it is not an emergency. It is never an emergency. Okay. So, okay. Interesting. So looks like uh, Brenna says to us that her husband is a nurse. So Brenna, my guess is you've heard lots and lots and lots over these past 18 months about how very stressful um, it can be for nurses on the front line of caring for COVID. But you know, even if we're not on the front front lines of caring for COVID, like in office, on the bedside, uh, many of our patients continue to complain to us. They're having difficulty accessing care. The number of people in need of mental health services continues to surge. Many of our patients are just languishing on waiting lists, right? Making and they're making call after call after call, only be, to be told, "I'm sorry, you know, I can't see you until December. I can't see you until January." No, my patient list is closed. So that's especially challenging for those of us because we know that there are lots and lots and lots of them. There's a lot of demand right now for our services um, and too few mental health care providers to offer them. So the pandemic has simply laid bare uh, what all of us has know, have known about for a long, long time, and that is there are just not enough of us to meet the demand, right? And that's stressful. That's very stressful on all of us because uh, most of us, hang on just a minute, I'm reading my notes. Remember, former television reporter, so I use a teleprompter here. Uh, most of us enter this business because we do enjoy caring for others and having to say no to new clients can trigger our own feelings of guilt, knowing that we typically refer uh, to others and that they're also full can trigger feelings of inadequacy. 
So as we continue to deal with the fallout from COVID-19 and prepare ourselves for possible surges, there may be another Delta, right? There is still plenty of time for us to be very, very intentional about deciding what our own personal approach to caring for patients is going to be. As a psychiatric nurse practitioner, my goal is to provide you with sound evidence-based ways of caring for yourself. While my recommendations are mostly geared for patient-facing healthcare workers, they really do apply to all of us. Whether our battlefield, battlefield is the bedside, behind a desk, in the homes of patients, or even in a clinic. Most of my recommendations are primarily based on the principles of psychological first aid. I know many of you are familiar with these. Uh, we call it PFA for short, and PFA specifically helps others in the immediate aftermath of disasters. PFA is specifically designed to foster both short and longer term improved functioning and coping skills. All right, so here is your first code word, COVID care. COVID care, COVID care. So this is really a theoretical slide. It's geared to those of you, again, especially nurses, and it sounds like we have at least uh, one family member who's a nurse, who like to respond to national emergencies. But you know, therapists uh, respond to national emergencies as well, particularly those of you who are trained in EMDR or trauma-based uh, kinds of therapies. I'd like to pause for just a moment and ask our audience, have any of you ever volunteered to work in the aftermath of a national emergency? And if you have, tell us when and for what it was. Oh, and thank you for that very sweet comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the work that therapists do is amazing as well. Um, in fact, I like to work very, very collaboratively with therapists. I, um, you know your clients sometimes better than I have the opportunity. Uh, you know when they need medication and you're pretty darn good at um, even suggesting a particular track for me. So thanks to the therapists. All right, looks like Ryan volunteered for the Joplin tornado. Somebody did Katrina with the Red Cross. Fascinating, and thank you for that kind of service. So as our answers continue to come in, and I'll let Katie kind of take a look at them and remind me, it looks as if the immediate threat of COVID is kind of waning right now. I know I'm twice, twice vaccinated and boosted, so I'm feeling kind of frisky myself and often find myself going maskless, whoops, into grocery stores. Um, again, I want us to be intentional about possible future emergencies that could arise. And I want you to be very, very thoughtful about how you yourself might respond in the sense, uh, in the case of a national emergency. And so good self-care always begins with an honest assessment of yourself. Um, and these are some important questions to ask to see if you have the emotional reserves necessary to volunteer for a crisis. Have you had recent surgery or medical treatments? Do you have any recent emotional or psychological challenges or even problems prior to COVID-19 or any other type of emergency? Have there been any significant life changes or losses within the past six to 12 months? And do you have what I call unresolved negative life events or earlier, life, earlier uh, events that might impact your ability to serve and serve well? Serving in such a capacity can definitely, oh, let's go to the next slide. Hold on, whoops, hang on. Again, I love technology. Let me just take a look at my notes here. Okay, very good. All right, and secondarily, let's assess our family's needs, right? We don't operate, no man is an island. We don't operate alone. So very straightforwardly and candidly ask yourself these questions. Is your family truly prepared? for you to work in environments where the risk of harm or exposure is not really known. Remember, COVID itself continues to evolve. And if you decide to volunteer in a crisis area, will your support system assume some family responsibilities while you're away, while you're working long hours? 
Uh, and you know, I was just amazed of those of you who are young parents with little kids at home and professionals during the COVID crisis. I could not believe at the time when it broke out, I was working as a psychiatric nurse practitioner for an FQHC in town and our medical director had just assumed the role of medical director and gotten a divorce and had two kids in school, like seven and eight years old. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how she managed to do it, but she did. So anyway, uh, just be, be very mindful about your own family's needs. Do you have any unresolved family or relationship issues that would make it challenging for you to focus on disaster related responsibilities? and make sure that you have a strong supportive environment to return to after COVID-19 ends. And I'm just gonna ask another question for those of you who volunteered in Joplin with Katrina, um, if you have any insights into what you would recommend to your peers about how to best prepare for deployment before you ever even leave, I would appreciate uh, your thoughts and advice. And I'll ask Katie to kind of keep a watch on those comments if they come in. All right, so uh, very good. So you've decided you're gonna you're gonna do it, right? You're gonna sign up. You're gonna go to work. You're gonna work in that disaster related area. Maybe you're just gonna continue to work during COVID itself as it continues to evolve. Make sure that you build your own emotional resilience by learning to recognize some common stress responses along with some more worrisome reactions. We'll talk about those in just a little bit. And don't be afraid to seek help or encourage others to do so, particularly if you notice the serious stress responses. So again, as as therapists, you're very familiar with these common stress responses. They range from an increase or decrease in activity level, difficulty sleeping, numbing out, becoming irritable, angry, frustrated, being a little confused, having a lack of attention. And I see this a lot with my highly stressed clients, difficulty making decisions. We, have, can, we can have physical reactions, highly, highly somatic complaints, particularly younger folks feel their stress in their bodies, right? Um, they tend to feel our, we tend to feel our stress along what I call our serotonergic pathway, uh, where all the serotonin lives in our gut, in our head. Um, we get belly aches, we get headaches, we're easily started. And then um, just the need to isolate yourself from family and friends. All right, we've got a nice little a nice little comment from Ryan coming in saying he's done EMDR myself following trauma exposure, life events quick quickly following, sooner the better. Oh, I agree, Ryan. And you know, you're going to send me on a little bit of a tangent, but it's and it I hope it doesn't turn into a rant, but um I will say I, the more clients I work with, the more I realize when a huge stressor occurs, it's no different than a physical stressor. It's no different than the heart attacks and strokes I used to care for. As a bedside nurse, you come to the emergency room, we do the CT scan, we measure your troponins, boom, 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 boom. We get you stabilized. Why don't we do that in mental health? Why don't we do that for ourselves? Why do we think, oh, well, you know, I'm gonna tough it out. I'm just gonna like talk to family and friends. I'm just gonna access good self-care. These are all really, really good points. But as Ryan mentioned, why don't we take the same approach for our mental health that we do with physical health? If you know you've been stressed and you've got acute stress disorder and you know it's at risk for turning into post-traumatic stress disorder, get into therapy, use EMDR, start talking to your friends and family immediately. If you need medicines, get on medicines. It's amazing the difference it can make and it's amazing how it can keep future exacerbations from happening, so good for you. And Brenna's saying, I think a good self-care routine before you go, uh, excellent. Tough part for COVID-19 responders is that most have not necessarily chosen to be in that position. Boy, that is so true, isn't it? Um, I'm remembering when it first started, uh, there were a group of nurses at one of our local hospitals who went on strike because there was a lack of PPE. There were no gowns, there were no gloves, there were no masks. Nobody really understood what COVID was. And instead of being supported by their leadership, uh, they were shamed. They were told that they held the strike simply to gin up membership uh, for their union. Very sad, um, very sad. It was later a very, the subject of a very good editorial in the Kansas City Star if you care to read about it. But yeah, self-care, yeah. Nurses were just 
told, go, go, go care for these folks. All right, so let's take a look at uh, some of our more serious stress responses. Thank you, Katie, for keeping me in line. If you could just move this forward, I appreciate that. There we go. All right, and again, as therapists, I know you all recognize these, but sometimes it's so much easier to see them in our clients, right, than in ourselves. Feelings of helplessness, isolation, hopelessness that kind of morph into these demoralized, alienated, resigned feelings. Compassion fatigue is what we call it. Um, your clients have been through trauma. Isn't it interesting how they are almost, they have a kind of a compulsive need to talk about it and to like share details and to kind of relive it again and again and again. Um, if you find yourself compulsively just reimagining very specific aspects of your own trauma or what you witnessed, um, that's a pretty serious stress response. Withdrawing and isolating, attempts at over-controlling, boy, that's huge, isn't it, in both your personal and professional lives? Um, an inability to let go. Um, becoming numbed out with substances, becoming overly preoccupied with work, experiencing drastic changes in your sleep. Be very, very concerned if you start to sleep too much or what I typically see, and I always know mm, there's probably a mood disorder at work here, is difficulties initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, or having early morning awakening. That's a sign that a serious mood disorder is developing. And if I would encourage all of you, if you see yourself in that position, or certainly when you see your clients in that position, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and reach out to a, to a provider, a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Uh, serious difficulties in your own interpersonal relationships and depression accompanied by hopelessness. All right, so practicing good self-care. Brenna mentioned earlier the importance of getting into a routine of good self-care prior to deploying for any kind of an emergency. I think too, this is important for all of us every day, but particularly right now, as we are dealing with the aftermath of clients who have been seriously, seriously stressed throughout the pandemic. Uh, make sure you limit your work time, take weekend breaks and vacations, plan for these things. Take frequent breaks at home and at work, five minutes an hour, set your watch. We've all got smartphones today, right? Set your watch. Um, and remember that every hour helps you pace yourself throughout the day. Uh, credible sources. I, I want to talk just a little bit about this. Um, you've heard me say that I'm a former journalist. And if I were to look at my phone right now, in fact, I was just making my wish list for Cyber Monday. It's amazing how many newspapers you can subscribe to for like hardly anything. I think I've got, well, let me look at last count. Uh, yeah, I have three, three magazines, three news, one, two, three, four newspapers. Uh, and then I've got a family that reads and we share newspapers. Anyway, what I'm saying is, okay, I'm a news junkie, right? And I find myself, if I listen to the news too much, getting really, really, really stressed and kind of negative. And uh, particularly if we listen to news media with a point of view, and they're out there. We have everything from highly conservative media to very liberal media. And then we have what I call credible or evidence-based news media kind of in the middle. Um, just remember that number one, I would ask that your source be credible. Um, and number two, that if you find yourself getting overwhelmed by listening to too much of the news media, that you just shut it off and listen to something that makes you happy instead, whether it's music, nature, taking a walk, uh, but just be very, very mindful and careful about the sources of, of news and media that you consume. Um, I remember again, when COVID first started, I was working at a QHC in downtown Kansas City, Missouri, and we were all overwhelmed and more than a little freaked out. And Luckily, he was an epidemiologist, so I found myself just stopping reading everything and only waiting for his particular emails because they were very informative and, and talked. Um, and again, Katie, I'd like to ask our audience today, um, what do each of you do to bring balance and harmony to the start of your work day, to start each of your days with intention? 
Thank you, Sherry. I agree. I too, I believe we do. We need to promote systems that support our own self-care. And yet that's so, it's so easy to get in on my side. I call it the RVU wheel, you know, that hamster wheel of production, 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 and it just gets exhausting. And if you go at it too hard and too fast, you start to forget the details of your clients' lives, let alone your own need to just take a breath and slow down. All right, so I'll let the rest of you uh, just continue to give ideas about, about what you do. I, I told you a few of my own. I'm interested in hearing what you all do as well. Okay, go forward to the next slide. And how am I doing on time? Pretty good? Okay, 10 away. Okay, very good. All right, so, uh, you know, again, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Oh, good, we're getting a comment. Hint. Get to work early and take time to be centered before mm -hmm. my day starts. Excellent, Julie. Thank you very much for that. Um, yoga before work. Morning gratitude meditation. Write down all my fears and worries. Taylor, now I have to ask, if you write them down, do you then tear them up <laughs> and toss them away <laughs> and recognize what you do and don't have control over? All excellent suggestions. Uh, I myself like to take what I call an awe walk every day with my my mother, 80, 84 year old mother and dog. She goes swimming, spend time with my dogs. Aren't they wonderful? And Taylor says yes, yes. Taylor, I'm not sure if you're if that's if you're a, a guy or a gal, uh, but you do tear up your worries. All all wonderful wonderful self care routines. Good. Intentionally connect at the beginning of each day, set my intentions and ask for divine support. Isn't that lovely? And oh, wow, don't your clients benefit from that kind of mindfulness as well? These are all lovely, lovely ideas. Thank you so much. All right, and here are just a few evidence-based. Again, uh, what does the evidence say? Um, what does science say? Um, you know, practice relaxation techniques throughout the day. Um, and I've got a better link at the end of my presentation. Um, this comes from a New York Times uh, kind of guided meditation um, that you can use. Uh, find a friend, use the buddy system to share emotionally upsetting experiences. Um, recognize when you're hangry and halt. <laughs> Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Uh, increase the activities that you find enjoyable, practice gratitude, um, bone a friend. Um, so hugely important, especially while we've been so socially isolated during COVID, just to gradually, gradually start reconnecting with friends and family we love with and without masks, right? We've had a few more wonderful, a few more lovely ideas, morning prayer and Bible study. Yes, one of the psychiatric nurse practitioners that I work with has a very, very strong faith life. And whenever we're facing difficulties in the practice, whether it's with a client or even how we're communicating, um, she never hesitates to share her, the insights that she has during her own morning Bible study. Uh, there's a new app. M1M, move one million that does a two to three minute workout every hour, really? Followed by a brief meditation. Oh, I'm stealing that one. I thank you, Christina. I think I'm going to, I'm gonna write that down, M1M. Hang on, let me take a note. Try that one out myself. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah, keep those great suggestions coming in, please. Uh, put it in a box. Um, you know, learn how to compartmentalize. Um, it's something that I don't know what it is. It's something, I'm, and, and I'm going to overgeneralize here, okay? It, in my experience, this is just my experience only, it is easier for folks with testosterone in their system, I'm thinking, you know, those who identify as men, to compartmentalize, they can just shut it off, put it in a box, not think about it and pick it up and look at it the next day. In my experience, particularly, uh, I work a lot with young women, it just sort of bleeds all over everywhere, right? That, that ability to, as Taylor does, write it down and then tear it up, take some time and some skill to learn, but it's a good, good uh, self-care practice. You can write, pay or draw, you can keep a journal, and of course you can limit your use of caffeine, tobacco, marijuana, other types of substances. All right. So um, just curious, um, and I think I can kind of guess, um, if you use breath work in your 
self-care routines, I would love to hear about that. Just drop a quick note or raise your hand uh, in the chat feature. All right, so what can you do when you're at work and you find yourself getting overwhelmed and stress? Um, you've got the receptionist coming and saying, gee, can you get this person in? You've got late clients, you've got canceling clients, you've got clients coming in and saying, oh, I hate masks, I don't, I don't wear a mask, or oh, I don't believe in being vaccinated, or you've got all this coming at you. Well, first of all, stop and recognize it, right? I always encourage folks to talk with their supervisors. Recognize that you do have agency over the way you work and how you work. And one of the lovely things about being a professional is we can have professional conversations with both our supervisors and our colleagues. Learn to maintain strong but flexible boundaries. It is important to learn to say no. I have this conversation almost every day with my staff and encourage them to say no to me. And guess what? They do. <laughs> Not always happy about it, uh, but they do. And I learn when they're able to say, no, I can't take this client or I can't do this psych eval. Um, it comes back one way or another. Perform regular check-ins with your support network, work with partners or in teams, take frequent breaks. I've said that before. Find a peer whose judgment you respect and ask them to perform a partnership or create a partnership with you for ongoing mutual support. Um, and practice radical acceptance. I know this concept comes from the DBT wor world. Um, the first time I heard it, I thought it was pretty darn cool. I won't review it here because I'm sure most of us in the audience already know what it means, but it's something that I teach my clients every day. Okay, we've got some more coming in about the breath work. Um, I meditate and do restorative yoga every morning. Also been implementing some yoga mindfulness and breathing strategies at the elementary school where I work at. It's been amazing. Oh, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I'm curious if you're teaching those techniques to your kiddos, to your colleagues, what, how you use those techniques at work. I think that would be fascinating for all of us to hear. And Brenna says, use the Headspace app. I like the little five minute breath and one minute breath breaks, yes. Uh, uh, Amy says, I use breath work. I like the four square breathing, teach that all the time to my clients. Isn't it awesome? Like to visualize breathing in and out of the palms of my feet. Oh, or even just three deep belly breaths. Very good. Send animated breath work gifts to my clients. Aw, so they can save to their phone. So it's an accessible visual. So nice. 10% happier app, lovely. Right now teaching teaching them to the kiddos. I'd love to provide some caregiver wellness, but baby steps. Oh, true, true. <laughs> Especially in a large organization, right? Yeah. Minimize caffeine in times of higher stress. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan, for saying that. Um, and let me just remind you all, because I see so many clients with anxiety, and I know you all see clients with anxiety as well. We talk to them very purposefully about caffeine because caffeine is like pouring fuel on the fire of anxiety, right? So I, and then that affects sleep. And then we get this new loop going. Um, just a rule of thumb. And I think I talk about this a little bit later is um, for those clients with high levels of anxiety, or if you find yourself with high levels of anxiety, yeah, caffeine can really get you up and going, but it can also keep you awake and anxious. So try to start tapering off depending on your sensitivity and how your adenosine receptors act. I would say, you know, noon, two o'clock at the latest. So thank you for all of those great, great answers. And we've got the second code work coming up, second code word, uh, self-care, self-care, self-care. That is our second code word. All right, so now, now that uh, while you're at work, um, we looked at the positive things to do. Now let's take a look at the negative things. Um, be careful not to become workaholics. It's easy to do, right? We've always got more clients than time. Uh, make sure you don't work alone too long without the support of colleagues. I'm particularly worried about those of us who continue to do telehealth. Yeah, telehealth was a great tool while we were in the midst of COVID, but if you're not yet coming back to work, seriously think about it. I think just those hallway chats, those lunch breaks, that ongoing clinical supervision, it's just not the same over Zoom or over a computer. So yeah, seriously think about, about coming to work. And just out of curiosity, um, I'm, I'm just curious how many of you are still working primarily via telehealth versus 
how many of you are back in person and were you intentional about that transition from telehealth to in-person work and how many of you are still kind of going back and forth um, again, working around the clock with few breaks, lots of negative self-talk that can reinforce your feelings of inadequacy or incompetency. Um, knowing if you're using food or substances as a support. Um, and of course, that stinking thinking, right? And I saw this so much in the nursing community. Uh, the need to kind of be the hero, to be the one with all the answers, to be the one with the best answers. We're, we're working hard in nursing. We truly are. But if you find yourself thinking thoughts like, oh, I, it'd be selfish of me to take a rest. Others are working around the clock. I should too. The needs of my patients or clients are, are important, or I can contribute the most, or I'm the only one who can do X, Y, or Z. Recognize that type of thinking and um, ask for some support. All right, and we hear from Julie. She's mostly in person with clients and telehealth for supervision. Okay, excellent. You know, I really admire um, those of you who are therapists because you really do place a huge emphasis on ongoing clinical supervision. I wish, I wish the same were true in the psychiatric nurse practitioner world or even the world of psychiatry. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna do a humble brag here. Um, well, actually it's gonna start with a, kind of a sad story. When I was a new grad, I was like, what happened to my clinical supervision? We had it all the time at Vanderbilt. And while I had psychiatrists I could ask questions of and therapists I could ask questions of, we didn't meet regularly. We didn't talk about countertransference. We didn't talk about medications. It was kind of a scary time for me. So at Inspired Psychiatric Care, we've just instituted, um, right now it's monthly and we'll probably go maybe bi-weekly, regular ongoing clinical supervision in which we sit down as a team with our therapists, our psychiatric nurse practitioners, our collaborative psychiatrist joins us and uh, we have ongoing clinical supervision. We had a very interesting case just two days ago uh, about a soldier. So, all right, so moving forward. Uh, next slide, thank you. So again, um, you know, we're still kind of winding down COVID, I think, I think, you know, we did it once before and then Delta reared its ugly head and we all started having to wear masks and, you know, social distance again. But please make every effort to seek out and give ongoing social support, check in with your colleagues, talk openly about the difficulties you've had that you're having and caring for your clients. Um, reach out and make some new friends, uh, take a vacation, uh, hmm, this next one's kind of a, a biggie, isn't it? Prepare for a worldview change that may or may not be mirrored by others in your life. Um, and again, you know, full, full disclosure, full transparency. I, I'm a nurse, so I'm vaccinated. Beginning, middle, and end of story. Um, I have loved ones, including a highly educated son of mine with a master's degree who feels otherwise about vaccines. Um, I have a, I have a stepbrother whom I dearly love, who, who is chronically ill, but feels that the, has very different views about vac the vaccine than I do. And so we've had to have some difficult conversations in our family and come to some difficult decisions. And, um, let's just say I'm looking forward to hosting Thanksgiving at our home this year and not being the vaccine police. I'm, I'm leaving it up to everyone in their own good judgment, um, but yeah, those, those were some difficult times. Uh, pay extra attention to your nutrition, to your health and your sleep and rekindle those close interpersonal relationships that you had prior to 18 months ago. Again, uh, make every effort to make time for self-reflection. I love the idea of keeping a journal. It gets your worries off your mind. It lets you do an emotion dump. Um, and it also lets you review the progress you've made. Practice receiving from others, find activities and people whom you enjoy that make you laugh. Give yourself permission to not have to be in charge all the time, not be the expert, not always have the answers. Increase the experiences that have spiritual or philosophical meaning to you. Um, anticipate that there may be some leftover or unresolved trauma and that you will experience upsetting recurring thoughts, maybe dreams, and that these will decrease over time and always, always ask for help uh, in things like parenting, in relationship issues, if you find yourself irritable or just having difficulties adjusting to life after COVID. And I think I've already asked this question, which is what is your uh, favorite uh, self-care activity? But again, pitch in, we got some great ideas. 
Finally, here are some things to avoid. You recognize these as difficulties or trouble signs in your own clients' lives. If you find yourself engaging in any of these activities, think about asking for a referral for therapy, ongoing therapy yourself, um, ongoing medication management, um, excessive use of alcohol, illicit drugs, or prescription drugs. I'm gonna go on just a tiny bit of a rant here about the benzodiazepines. Um, we're learning more and more as prescribers that they are not so good. Um, we have a, a practice within our own practice that if someone is uh, kind of naive to benzodiazepines, we don't ever start a client on new ones. If we have someone coming to us who's been on them for many, many, many years uh, because of the risk of seizures associated with abrupt withdrawal of benzodiazepines, we develop a plan um, to very carefully begin weaning patients from benzodiazepines. And just to remember, these are the meds that end in PAM, you know, lorazepam, um, diazepam, um, clonazepam. They interfere with sleep, which is critical for recovery and long-term use puts patients at use for, excuse me, long-term use puts clients at risk for dementia. And there's lots and lots of other problems as well. Uh, don't make any big life changes for at least a month after, after the crisis has ended. Um, don't, when you're doing your life review or what you contributed, um, don't negatively assess yourself. Give yourself kudos for um, what you have done. Make sure you're not staying too busy. Don't make others more important than yourself. Um, and don't, I didn't exactly phrase this well. It's not that I want you to avoid talking about the strong emotions you felt during the COVID crisis. I would instead ask you to own those feelings, talk openly about them, um, and model, frankly, what that's like for um, your friends, for your family, and even when it's appropriate, self-disclosure with your clients. Okay, let's go back. Just one last slide, if we could. Sorry. Um, and finally, as we get to close to the end of my, my little talk here, I'd like to remind all of us, each of you sitting in with me today, thank you so much, the two of you sitting here in the room, making this possible, um, Resolve itself for making the conference possible, that we have so much to celebrate, right? Even during and after COVID, um, we've got a story to tell. We've helped shepherd our clients' most important milestones. We help them weather school difficulties, friendship challenges, transitioning through life's many stages from the time they're children until they're, they're very, 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 if you will, elderly, frail, frail elderly, and even through death. We share in their most joyful as well as their saddest times. We provide comfort and solace, and we help build resilience and strength during life's most intimate moments. And I admire each of you, and I'm so grateful for the ongoing service and good work each of you provide for your clients. Thank you. All right, and we can move forward now. These are just work cited. Um, Brooke and Katie, will folks have access to the slides afterwards so they can download these if they want to? Okay, excellent, excellent. And now I think uh, it's probably time for questions. Any questions? And just to review those code words again, they were COVID care and self-care, COVID care and self-care. So we'll just kind of hang out here for a few more minutes. All right, so I don't really see any questions coming in. Um, so at that point, so what I'll go ahead and do is I'll in my point, my part of the presentation, thank you again for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've totally enjoyed it. Um, can I let everybody take a quick break? Yes, yes. Okay. And we'll just kind of switch here for Perfect. a five or 10 minute break or? Um, it'll be, we'll start again at 10.43. 1043. Okay, 1043. guys, have a great day and a great weekend and happy Halloween.